for a brand new episode of The Witching Hour. I am Perry Nemiroff, and I am sitting across from my wonderful co-host. It's Haley Fouch, Hello. and we also have two great guests in the room. If you have not read my review of Freaks or heard us sp- speak about the movie, uh, Koi did a special Q&A at San Diego Comic-Con. We're big fans of this one, and we are so happy to have directing duo Adam B. Stein and Zach Lepofsky in the studio. Hello. Oh gosh, we How are, are you guys doing? so much. We're very being excited. here right now. This very is crazy. Excited. Oh, I so think I said your name. You. Lip, Lipsky? A Lipovsky. Lipovsky. Is how I would okay. say it. But Lipovsky. go for whatever you want. <laughs> I think I just wrote it wrong in my notes. And uh, Lipovsky makes yeah, way more sense than what I have written here right now. It's uh, it's a tricky one. In fact, um, when we, we met on a reality show uh, 12 years ago, and Gary Marshall was one of the judges of that show. And we were contestants trying to like make it as filmmakers. And he said, Zach, you, you, you're going to be a big star one day, but you got to change that name. You got to <laughs> get a simple name. You know, you, you, gotta, you need a dog in your movie. He was just like a crazy guy. But, oh, no. Dogs so, in movies make us nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I always used to think the same thing if I ever wanted to have anything where my name had to be said easily. <laughs> Nemiroff is one of the worst last names to have. But then there's the vodka out there. So right. now my name is plastered all over. I think it's like MMA Rings and Trust stuff, me, it's great. as an Adam Stein, you need to have a more <laughs> unique name because there's too many of the basic ones out there. Uh, there's a downside though. I'm the only person with my exact name and the exact spelling. You're way too findable online. <laughs> you cannot hide. Up well, to creepy. everything here. You know what else is frustrating? The fact that I can never see a, a Perry item in a souvenir store with my like I can never get a keychain or a mug no, with my name either. on it because it's never spelled right. Well, if it's there at all. There's uh, two other Adam Steins in the film industry and they all get congratulated when one of them does something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like we all share it together. <laughs> I for sure went to one of their IMDb's and was like, nope, not my guy. <laughs> Who was I just, uh, oh, uh, there's on Ready or Not, there's a writer named Ryan Murphy. And I had uh-huh. to specify in my review. I'm like, Ryan Murphy, but not that Ryan Murphy. Give this Ryan Murphy the credit. <laughs> that name feels pretty taken. Yeah, it does. I kind of feel bad, but what can he do about it? <laughs> um, to kick off our conversation right now, I wanted to ask you, what was the gateway film that got you guys into horror? At what point did you realize it wasn't just, oh, yeah. this is fun, but I got a passion for this kind of filmmaking? Well, from for me, it was very young. Uh, my mom... She was a TV producer, and a friend of hers who was a director was like, oh, my God, you got to take Zach to this movie. It's Jurassic Park. It's about dinosaurs. And I was like nine and a half or ten and had only ever seen, like, kids' movies. And my mom had no idea what she was walking me into. So mm-hmm. we sat down in this huge theater, and I was terrified. I was convinced I was going to be eaten by dinosaurs for a good hour, you know, like, just – and literally crying and covering my eyes. I don't know why my mom didn't take me out of the theater, but I was, like, terrified. But then I had this sort of transitional moment sort of after the T-Rex paddock scene where I realized I hadn't died. (laughs) I I had not been eaten and then realized I had missed everything and was totally upset now at the fact that I had missed the whole movie and I wasn't going to see dinosaurs and because I was too scared. And and now I realize movies can't kill you. And then, so then the Velociraptor scene at the end was sort of all I saw of that film and that, and that, and then realized Wow, this is so exciting, and, and I want to experience this again. And so then I was kind of addicted from that point. That's on. a hard answer to top in yeah. my book. Jurassic Park is my favorite movie of all time. That is a lot of love for that movie in this yeah. room. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I don't Are recommend not- showing it to ten year olds though, <laughs> who've never we, seen it. We you know. stress in this room also about recommending movies to children. Our whole last episode was a discussion about like what's too much for kids. I feel like everyone who's into horror saw movies way too young. Of course, but they sure. shouldn't have seen and that's why because it's so fascinating uh so my parents had as a kid of the 80s my family had a a huge bootleg movie collection where we would go rent movies my parents would go rent movies and then every time we rented a movie they would immediately like copy it and put it on the (laughs) shelf you know we had the the camera to vcr oh yeah that was my Basically dad's Basically, like, too. system, you know? Yeah. Had, you got that, too? Oh, yeah. He was he was pre-internet pirating for a really long time. Oh, yeah. We had hundreds of just VHS tapes, and they weren't, like, ordered or cataloged or anything. So I would just go, oh, The Shining, what's that? You know, and just pop it in. And that's Must be the about first something shiny. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I said. Sounds like a great kids movie. And, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a great kids movie in retrospect. <laughs> very twisted and just haunting and I mean I just remember being like just gripped the entire time that you know that feeling of paranoia and and 
uh, you know, the next shoe to drop stuck with me. It's Sounds funny. like you're describing your movie now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it inspired us, yeah. It's uh, one of those films that I, I love. I'm really passionate about this sort of growing trend in genre right now, which is like, what is the genre of the film? Mm. It's, you know, it's a thriller, a mystery, sort of superhero y, <laughs> horror y. Yeah. It's a lot going on. Some people yeah. have described it as the kitchen sink of genre. There you go. Uh, which, we, which we adopt. We love that. I mean, it, it's funny because when we were writing it, we didn't really think about, like, oh, which genre is this going to fit into? And that's probably why it ended up the way it ended up because we were really just focused on the characters and the family and, and, and telling the story through. Chloe's perspective, you know, this this seven year old girl at the center of the film, and so the movie kind of evolves as her emotions evolve. Mm. Yeah. So at the beginning of the movie, she's terrified and doesn't know what's going on. So it's very mysterious and feels like a horror film. Um, but quickly, you know, she's in this house that she's never allowed to leave. But at about the twenty minute mark, she's for the first time she goes outside, and it suddenly starts feeling like a Spielberg movie with like a lot of wonder and and but then kind you of still have this feeling of dread. Something's like, not oh, quite right. Crap! Something's about to happen. And then eventually she transitions to revenge and bloodlust, and you start feeling like Tarantino, or and then it becomes sort of an adventure thriller. And you know, so it, basically, we just looked at whatever she's going through are the cinematic devices we're going to use because the movie, the whole movie is from her perspective to the point where we shot the movie from her height so that all the angles of all the adults you're looking up their noses and stuff because she's <laughs> looking up at all their noses and yeah, it like makes them really threatening and DP weird. DP probably has back problems now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Especially with the cameras that we could afford. They were super heavy. Oh boy. <laughs> what was like the nugget of an idea that kind of sparked the whole thing? Was it the big picture like superpower type thing or was it the character of Chloe if not something else? It was a, it, the main inspiration was um my son, I was a, I was sort of a new father when we started writing. I had a five year old kid, and we were always just Zach and I were just fascinated talking to him about the world and seeing him kind of experience and try to figure out the world. His perspective of what was real and what was fake was completely different than us, because mm-hmm. to him, yeah, dragons and well, the and Greek gods. He, he's that definitely is, sure that's that, real. Like, they were real. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then a car alarm would go off and he'd be terrified. You know, so the, so kids are just constantly trying to figure out what is real, what's safe, what's not safe, and and then they do, and they kind of join us in the world of commonly accepted understanding <laughs> uh, most of the time. But we started thinking like, okay, if you had a sci-fi world, what then, and and then could put the audience in the kids' point of view, then uh, you wouldn't be sure what's real and what's not, just like they're not sure. And as the characters figuring it out the world, you're figuring out the world. And so that was kind of the first nugget of like, oh, that sounds mm-hmm. kind of interesting. I wonder what would happen, you know? So that was that was the first starting point for it. Something I'm really curious about is the approach to making a movie that feels this big when you, you guys have mentioned a low budget a <laughs> couple of times. Um, how do you approach that in the scripting phase to be like, we know we don't have the means to go just make this huge world, so you have to write it in. How yeah. did you approach that? No, definitely, we, we approach it in a few ways. One is, something that most people do when they you know start at this budget level is make it a contained thriller so that the movie's in one location because that makes it cheaper but we were very aware that often people have the reaction when they start a movie and they realize it's a contained thriller they kind of immediately go oh it's one of these movies that never leave the house <laughs> and so you know we wanted to make sure that we went beyond that you know that it felt like that you had because contained thrillers are good because it keeps the tension high but we wanted to make sure it, it grew and grew and grew. And as we were writing, we tried to think of all sorts of different ways to grow the scope naturally through the film. So at the beginning, she she leaves the house. Um, so that's one way. But then also, as the climax builds throughout the end, what she's able to do and what the things are that happen in the movie without giving too much away <laughs> add to so much more scope, even though they're contained to one location, you get the sense of such a bigger world than what you can see. But also, we just did practical things in the script, like making sure, look, we can't afford to see a helicopter, but we can hear one. (laughs) And (laughs) Sound is a a big cheat, where you can make the world feel a lot bigger. (laughs) There's a a whole scene near the end where she's trapped, you know, under this pile of rubble. 
and you're hearing crazy stuff going on, but you're just watching her. So yeah, so, you're hearing a whole crowd of people, but you're just seeing a few people through the mist. Like a little piece died of me inside when I remember back to film school and my thesis <laughs> film, and we tried to put a VFX uh, helicopter in it, yeah. and it's like if it was oh. just in the damn cabin and we just heard it, we would have saved so much money. That yeah. is some waste. good advice right there. Yeah, <laughs> but in terms of the the scripting, like. To take a step back, basically this movie came about because Zach and I were sort of struggling filmmakers who were getting some work but also getting fired from projects <laughs> that weren't happening. Because we weren't big enough. We were just sort of like trying to get a movie made and, and you know, basically when you're in that position, it's really hard. No one and, wants to let you do it. So you have to kind of think of a way to make it happen without anyone's permission. So, so we just sat down and said, okay, if we had to make a movie for zero dollars that was still in that sort of sci-fi horror Thriller. feel that we love, how could we do it? And, and that was one of the, the first Yeah, one know, of the big inspirations was um, Mark Duplass actually gave this really famous speech at South by Southwest. It's so good. Yeah. And so we... <laughs> you know I'm talking about? I do, yeah. 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 So it's... You know, if anyone hasn't listened to it or seen it, it's called The Cavalry's Not Coming. And we both just like sort of lived by every word of that speech and and basically just followed his advice we, in his, his his first. He gives many steps and we're at like step three now. But, <laughs> but his first step is like just survey everything you have. You've got something like you may not have money, but your uncle owns something. Your dad works somewhere. You own a camera of some kind. Like write down all the things you got. You know, his first movie, they had a puffy chair in a van and they made a movie about a puffy chair in a van and that launched their careers. And so originally, um, literally taking a page from their book, Adam and I were going to act in it. His son was going to be the kid. We we're going to shoot it in his house. And the only other location in the movie is a restaurant. And his family runs a restaurant in, in L.A. And so that we wrote that movie for us to go make it without anybody's well, assistance. That was the first draft. Um, and it, it would have been terrible if we acted in it. So right. I'm glad but we, we could have made it. The important thing in what he says is, like, make that movie for 10 grand. Make it for 100 bucks. Like, just make that movie no matter what. And when you make that movie, it will lead to opportunities for you to do it again at a, at a bigger level. And what ended up happening with great fortune for us, we were prepared to basically never give the keys away. We were going to make this movie if it had to be us acting in it or not. But as we wrote the script and we created it, People that we knew and friends started being like, hey, I think this is actually pretty good. Hey, actually, I'll give you a little bit of money. And, oh, well, now we have a little bit of money to get a casting director. Well, let's – we may as well at least show it to actors that aren't us to see what we can get. Yeah, and maybe someone will like it enough even though we're not paying them much. You know. You know, and the first person to, to respond was Bruce Dern. Nice. So now suddenly we had a two-time <laughs> Academy Award nominee. In my role. So now I can't taking play Zach's, that. <laughs> taking Zach's role. Um, so, and it kind of you know, went from there and, and grew a little bit. But, but we, never, we never gave up that, um, that ethos of we're just going to do this. No one can stop us. Because that's what, that's what um, hamstrung us on our previous projects, the ones that I said we got fired for. <laughs> Basically, it was sort of like, on those projects, it was, you know, meant to be $10 million movie, uh, something like that. And then you've got Zach or Adam at a $10 million movie ha after, for having never done one. And eventually they just say, uh, well, maybe we need a bigger director. So that's usually how things w had worked. Or off often what happens with most movies is... To get this amount of money, you need this actor. But to get that actor, you need this thing. And by the time you get that thing, that money's gone. And you can it just never comes together. So we literally lived by that only if we can make the movie with no matter what. So if we get 100 grand, great, we're making it for 100 grand. Yeah. If we get 150, great, we're making it for 150. And there were people that came to us close um, to near the end when we were shooting. And they're like, we'll give you 300 grand. We're like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> but you need to hire this type of person, blah, 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 these you know requirements. And we were just like... Sorry, but no, like we don't have time to go through that process. We can't accept your money. We're making the movie anyway. And and that contagion actually started working in our favor. Some people just started coming on board because we, they realized we were going on without them. <laughs> and so they were like, okay, well, I guess I'm involved. And And so the beauty of this movie is it was something that was started with that Mark Duplass, you know, message. And it has done everything that he kind of hoped that it, he said that it would, is you make your movie in your voice with whatever you've got, and luckily it ended up being more than we had initially, and you show it to the world. And 
and they get to see what your voice is. And then from there, you meet new people and new actors and people that said no originally might now say yes. <laughs> and you can go on to hopefully make other projects bigger than the last, you know. And so if he's listening out there, thanks, Mark. <laughs> uh, basically, we're all here because of him. I am so happy that this all had a very happy ending for you guys. <laughs> but I am so alarmed by the fact that you were hired to direct something and then you were fired. And then I think as you said you were fired, you said because you weren't big enough. Yeah. Like, how how can that even happen? And at what phase of the process of filmmaking is like well, what's the cutoff for something It happens every like day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so crazy how much work you can put into something with never getting paid and never making the movie. And having know? no control over the, if you are the one to do it. There yeah. were projects that we both worked on for years where we tried to, you know, basically get it made. And because it was at a higher budget level, it just wasn't well, getting we each, made. Yeah, we each had a different experience. One, Mine was a passion project that this writer that I knew before he was a big deal, then he became a big deal, and suddenly, suddenly his old scripts were valuable, <laughs> even though they hadn't changed. And... I was attached, but I wasn't a big deal. And they didn't think with me attached they could get meaningful actors. So they fired me to get an actor, a, a bigger director that they thought could get bigger actors. In, in Adam's case... It was, it was a big producer who was involved. And I worked on the script with the writer for years. And a started, script they were never going to make. Started meeting <laughs> actors and, you know, met some really fantastic actors who wanted to be involved. But then they just decided, you know, that that movie, it seems like it would only be like you know, a one, two, three million dollar movie. We only make $15 million movies, so we're gonna get rid of him, <laughs> hire a director who can justify that. You know, yeah. it, it happens all the time. I mean, this for is every, so alarming, every movie, I can right like, now. Probably, for every movie that you see, that whether it's good or bad, there's probably 20, 30, maybe 100 movies that didn't get made yeah. for every movie that does. So. There's every director could tell you all the stories and all the wonderful films that never got made. And that's why we we were just it happened so many times that we were just like we just got to do something where we control it at every stage, even if that means even that, if it means we're, you know, we're the ones uh, making the food for craft service. <laughs> and, you know, oh, the the attic has old insulation. Well, let's get in there with our masks and gloves and clear it out like it was that kind of project. Yeah. What's your best advice for mentally rebounding when that happened? Because as you guys said, it happened a lot. So how I do mean, you get out of that funk? That's I mean, for every artist, no matter what your craft is, whether it's acting or or writing or painting or, or being a director, you have to be the type of person who's willing to get up every day and be told no and get up every day and just be told no again and just be like, that's okay. I'm going to keep going forward. And, and the reason is because it's your only choice. It's just who you are. There's no – the pursuit of that is the only reward that you – that gives you a sense of purpose and, and kind of joy. So if you're the type of person who's told no and you give up, go find something that'll make you happy <laughs> that isn't the arts uh, because basically for us it's the only thing that brings us joy so you can tell us no a, a thousand times and we'll keep getting up and accepting that punishment and I think actually finding each other helped us yeah. get through it in a way because you know we'd been struggling with that and then when we started really like collaborating in a serious way it it really helps not go through it alone like to have a partner that you can say, oh, man, that sucked. OK, what do we do next? <laughs> was so helpful and, you know, emotionally and also just strategically. There's one trick we use um, that we – there's some inspirational speaker. I, I wish I knew who it was. But we saw this video. He, he People probably know who he is. Um, but he basically – he's a he's like a teacher um, for musicians at like Juilliard or some really big school. And he teaches all the musicians that when they screw up, when they're at an audition and they don't do their best or they snap a string or they, someone else does better than them, when, when something goes horribly wrong, immediately, without thinking, throw your arms in the air and scream, how fascinating! And it basically <laughs> immediately changes your perspective from this was terrible to how interesting. I love Look that. at this terrible thing that just happened. That's so fascinating. I'm going to take we, that out of this room and do it to yeah. someone in this studio. I was yeah. going to say, we're going to be saying out. how fascinating a lot and, and in this it, office we, now. We honestly said it every day making this movie. Like, something goes wrong I, every day. There was crazy experiences that we never got to have that were also so educational because we were also producing it ourselves too. So, for instance, when we did start hearing from actors who might want to be in the movie, then we had to negotiate with their agents. 
Like we'd never done anything like that. So then, you know, we'd have agents on the phone screaming at us, you know, about how little we're paying their actors. <laughs> like, I know, isn't it crazy? Um, and just coming at it from that how fascinating perspective of like, I just got off the phone and someone was screaming at me for 10 minutes. Like, how fascinating. Um, That's fabulous. So, it definitely yeah. helps. Yeah. yeah. So having minimal resources and pulling off this movie that truly I think every penny you had and then some is represented on screen. What is one moment in particular that you can highlight that when you were on set doing it, you're like, this looks ridiculous. How is it ever going to work? And then it wound well, up there's coming one out great. That oh, immediate, yeah. There's one that immediately comes to mind. <laughs> Uh, which is near the end of the film, but it was basically our last day of shooting. You know, we had a crew that was paying. Was, we were the smallest show in the city, so if anyone was there to make money, they, you know, they they, they could easily a terrible make, mistake. They could make a lot more money doing almost anything else in the city, and and it was a tough shoot. Not a lot of people. So by the end of the shoot, people had you know put a lot on the line. They were very tired. We were shooting nights, and the last scene of the movie um, is in this uh, abandoned mine. And our art department had been really just like putting everything on the line and they were behind and the whole climax builds to this moment where this incredibly impressive giant door opens and we got there the day of and there was no door. And they're like, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. We're building it. We're We're building building it. it. And they they, they had been up for like 30 hours at this point and they're like sawing pieces of plywood. Do you guys know noises off? That movie. Yeah, it reminds me of like the, um, the the perfect strangers guy who's like trying to build things as he's sleep deprived. And so we're filming. We start. They, they don't. The door doesn't need to be done till like halfway through the shoot day in the middle of the night because we're shooting during the night because of this mine is only open to us at night, and. We're shooting, and eventually I walk over there, and it's still, like, half-built, and there's, like, cookie tins glued to it, and it just, like, looks like the worst thing ever. And I just know it's not going to be done, and I just turn to one of our producers in the grips, and I just say, tear it down. Like, (laughs) just tear it down and put a green screen there. I don't know how, but at some point, we're going to be able to afford an amazing CG door, but right now, we cannot. (laughs) And so We can't shoot cookie tin door. and And so they, within seconds, they just rip the whole thing apart. Our entire art department quit because they had just, oh, the, oh, and we still wow. had many more sets that day that they hadn't built, and they put up a green screen, and uh, yeah, we shot we shot it just trusting at some point someone will volunteer to we'll make take pity on us and an, make impress, a door. an impressive three D door, um, and someone did, and it's one of the coolest looking shots of the movie and very iconic parts of the movie, and and our producer, one of my oldest friends, who was a producer, he had just come from a wedding that day, and it was the middle of the night. He was in an incredibly expensive suit and was shooting in this mine. And I said, our art department just quit. And there's a whole other set that hasn't been built. <laughs> but they left all the pieces over here. Can you go build it so that in an hour we have something to shoot? And he in the mine picked up all this mm-hmm. stuff. And he was like, built this whole set. His whole suit, his shoes, everything was completely ruined by mine water. And But it was there. And that was kind of the love and hard work that the movie took. The door does look good. It yeah. does. I would never <laughs> Um So you have an art department that quits. You have someone who wrecks a suit to build a set on his own. (laughs) What happens when you show them the finished product for the first time? Have you ever touched base again with the folks that maybe didn't make it through? Absolutely. And I think um, shock and surprise (laughs) is their biggest No, we don't hold a grudge. We know that it was a super hard shoot. Like, we asked people. We're grateful for everything that anyone did along the way. And, you know, we we actually had another producer who, um, who... basically quit uh, in it, it, right at the end of the shoot because he was just so overwhelmed and intimidated by the financial situation. <laughs> and, and lack their and he's like, oh my God, we're out of money. What do we do? How do we pay all these bills? And he basically just disappeared because he couldn't deal with that stress. And we weren't, we don't hold a grudge. It's just sort of like, yeah. How man. fascinating. Look, yeah, we have man. no money <laughs> left. How yeah, interesting. We have no money. Like, we get it. Um, so we've, we've, all those people have now seen the movie. You know, we were at Vancouver Film Festival, which is where we shot the movie. And all those people came and they were just like, whoa, it really came together. Wow. Um, and it's just so awesome to share that, that feeling because they, they're the ones who know most what it was like to make the movie. So it's really cool to be able to share that with them. Yeah, there was many, one of the key moments I remember is Bruce Dern was on set. And we wanted to like encourage him to show him, because clearly this was like a lower budget than he's used to in most of his great work. It's not a Tarantino movie. (laughs) And, you know, 
most of our lights and everything were at, basically the few lights we could afford were outside the windows pointing into the rooms, just kind of giving a general natural light. And on the kind of week in, we showed him like a bunch of still frames because we thought they looked really cool to like encourage him to see that this is really coming together, looking like a real movie. And he's looking at the still frames. He's like, wow, this is incredible. And all this without a gaffer or a lighting team. (laughs) Because he didn't even see the lights. He just assumed we had no lights whatsoever. We're like, no, we have lights, Bruce. They're just outside the windows. We just have a couple of them. But a lot of the scenes were just lit lit by flashlights. That is wild. You guys talked about how like finding each other was really important. How do you practically collaborate when it comes to writing, when it comes to on set? What what is your process in in practice? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, You know, with writing, we basically outline for a really long time. And we do that by just sitting with each other and telling the story to each other back and forth. It's funny if you ever see us in a coffee shop because we're often jumping up from the table and acting out scenes to convince <laughs> the other person. No, no, no. What if she doesn't open the door? And she just climbs on a thing and unlocks all the, you know, and, and everyone in the coffee shop's going, what the heck is going on at that table? Everyone knows you write your best screenplays in coffee shops. In oh, LA. yeah. Well, it was actually funny. We went to the coffee shop that we wrote this movie in. Uh, um, a few months Bricks ago. Bricks and scones Bricks. on Larchmont. And we, wa- and, we, and we walked over there, and still a lot of the same people that were there when we were writing this movie were there, and we felt like kind of like Moses or something, being like, it can be done! It can be! You can, the screenplays will be made! Like, um, but they're still there working uh, away. <laughs> yeah, so, so we basically like just kind of spitball back and forth on each scene, and we start jotting down the bullet points. And then often we go back through it and go, oh, that doesn't work, actually, and we do it all over again. But there's definitely um, moments where one of us feels strongly about something and the other feels very strongly about the opposite. And it's, you know, that process we've come to learn ends up creating much better work than either of us could have done individually because if he, Adam sees it really strongly one way and I see it really strongly some other way, usually that means there's something actually broken about the scene inherently. Mm-hmm. Or we kind of ask, well, why Why do you think that that's important? And why do I think this is important? What's a third idea that could achieve both? And usually that's hard, but when we find it, it's always better than either idea individually. Um, and it takes work and it takes being putting your ego aside. Um, but we've just found that the work ends up being a lot better. And we like to think of it as there's twice as much brain power rather than um, half having each. half each. Um, <laughs> and then on set, there's lots of different things we do. We just try and make sure that one of us is at each scene. We kind of alternate who's the voice to the crew and the actors. So there's sort of one voice rather than two different voices. And we've learned all sorts of tiny techniques just through doing it. Things like when I arrive on set, if I've been away, before saying anything, I check with Adam. Because <laughs> often I would have come to set and be like, that isn't supposed to be over there. It's supposed to be over here. And they'd be like, oh, the other director just said put it here. And <laughs> so, like, because of something that's happened when I wasn't there. Um, and we also... It's kind of like a superpower. Because yeah. when one of you is right with the actors, you, you can really talk to them in a more intimate way and really kind of get deeper with them. But... You need to also have the global view that you get when you watch a monitor way back, you know, 10 feet away. So we get to have both, and it's really cool. And then usually the person who's right there front and center is the one talking to everyone. But the other one will come from the monitor and sort of scurry forward and whisper in their ear, like, it was out of focus. Like, we got to do it. <laughs> um, yeah, there was, so, I remember at the end of the movie, there's an incredibly emotional scene with the lead actress, uh, Lexi. Um and she's crying, and it's incredibly emotional. And we shot that for almost like a, like a half an hour running take. And Adam was basically hiding under the rubble with her, just sort of working with her. And uh, but he had no idea what we were shooting. Basically, he was just I couldn't see the camera. Um, the camera was and then he, I just remember him crawling out from this rubble, covered in dirt, you know, basically with tears in his eyes, and just kind of being like, "Did we get it?" <laughs> like he had no clue. But she wouldn't have gotten there without him. And I was able to watch the monitors and give notes to the camera people while it was happening so that we captured that moment. Um, So we find that that it ends up being hugely beneficial, but it does take a lot of work to make sure it's efficient. She is so good, and like, yeah. like she's, I think she's too good. <laughs> it's How, crazy. Like, where do you find someone like her? Is that through any kind? Because I know it's it's a lot harder probably when you have you've got Bruce Dern coming out to you to sign on to your project, but yeah. then where do you find this kind of you well, know? We definitely like when we were working on the script. There were a couple times where we looked at each other and thought oh my God, we're really stupid. We're writing this whole movie that needs a seven-year-old superstar. 
Like, how are we ever going to find this person? And we, like, watched a lot of movies like Room and Beast of the Southern Wild and stuff. But, like, mm-hmm. when you watch it, we were like, oh, the, the girl in Beast of the Southern Wild is so good. We got to watch that. We watched that movie. She, like, basically doesn't speak in that movie. It's all she's, voiceover. I mean, she's incredible. <laughs> she's an incredibly incredible. performance. But it's all done through voiceover. And she has, like, so few lines. And we were like, oh, man, we've given this little girl, like, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of lines. <laughs> what have we done? Like, maybe they did that for a reason. Yeah. And we're really, really stupid. I feel like watching <laughs> Jacob Tremblay in Room, though, might have he's, been encouraging in right. a different I mean, respect. Uh, yeah. Look, Quivengine is amazing also. <laughs> we were just trying to reach for something like that. And it's very, very hard to mm-hmm. find. You know, those those there's a reason those kids get so much recognition because it's very rare you know, Room, Beasts, Florida Project. Mm. Like, finding a kid like that is incredibly needle in a haystack stuff. Um, And we knew we wanted to um, get to a very real place with her. Uh, So we approached the audition process in a in a different way. Usually kids come into auditions and they're very like rehearsed because their parents have drilled them on the lines. They want to make sure they get every word correctly, but they've forgotten all about the meaning behind it. And they won't change. Like if, if the lines, dad, I hate you. You'll be like, okay, good. Now say it angrier. Dad, I hate you. Okay, now quieter. <laughs> dad, I hate you. And it's just like, it's just the same no matter what you right. do. And so we took a different approach and we, we had them come in to the audition room and we were just there with our shoes off on the floor like with coloring books and we just said hey you know just sit down color with us for a little bit and you know let's talk about life you know you know (laughs) life's crazy huh (laughs) how about when you like get mad at your parents you ever get mad at your parents and and we just kind of try to get to know them a little bit and then eventually we'd say like you know what that time your your parents wouldn't let you go to that sleepover like let's do that scene let's just improv that scene we had a friend who was there to read with them and would just improv these scenes from their own lives. And to get we, at the real emotion, we would see like who which kids could kind of access the real emotions. Because one of the other things about being a dad is that I, I realized something I wasn't aware of before I was a dad, how fierce kids can be, how <laughs> passionate, how what big emotions they have. Yeah. You know, they go huge on the anger and huge on the sadness. <laughs> And, and and huge on the love, like three seconds later. <laughs> and, and, and you don't see that very much on screen. You know, most kid roles are very sort of flat. And we wanted to go to those big places. Um, but we needed actors who weren't afraid to go there. And when we were with Lexi, you know, from the very beginning, she was reading with our friend or improvising with our friend. I want to go to that sleepover. I, you never let me go to the sleepover. And, and her eyes were tearing and her nostrils were flaring. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we'd, we'd kind of feed in the lines of like, try to make it about ice cream now instead of sleepover. And she would just kind of seamlessly bring in the real lines from the scene, but with that same emotion. And, and then when we were kind of like almost scared by her fierceness, <laughs> it was like, whoa, this is powerful. And we said, okay, okay, that's great. Okay, stop there. That, that was wonderful. You know, cut. And she immediately switched back to, like, happy seven-year-old girl. And she's like, oh, my God, you guys are so fun. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, you're a really good actor. You know that? <laughs> um, and that was really important, too, um, because we wanted it. We, she had the maturity to know that this is pretend um, because there were a couple other kids that we were considering at the time who, who could get to that fierce place, but then you could tell we're sort of rattled afterward by that emotional experience. Mm -hmm. And Lexi really just... She saw it as an exciting dive into her craft. Like, she saw... She was excited by the fact that she was able to get there, rather than traumatized. So that, you know, we had to do this day after day after day, so we needed someone of that maturity. And once you found her, was there any tailoring that role to her specifically? Um, mostly in sort of the details of the world. So like in, in this, in the movie, they've been in this house for seven years. So the house itself is a huge character and we wanted her to kind of put her imprint. So like Mm -hmm. most of the drawings in the house are from her. Um, and we let her sort of arrange her room and like and that kind of stuff. But, but so she was also the art department. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, free art child, department. child labor. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, also, when we were shooting, I mean, we did a huge amount of improv. The, that kind of thing we talked about with the audition, we continued while we were shooting. Because this was the first thing we had written, 
Um, and we were used to like being well, directors. The first thing we'd written that got made. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we were, this is the first thing we directed that we had also written. In the past, when you direct someone else's stuff, you kind of have to be uh, aware of the writer's desires. Mm. Um, and, and, and and your boss's desires. You're you're directing a movie for a studio or a network. Yeah. You're sort of there the client and you're delivering their movie. Yeah. Whereas in this case, we could change the script yeah. or change the idea whenever we needed to. So when we would do a scene, we would know, okay, this is the essential element of this scene. But the actual wording doesn't matter as much. So we would kind of do the same thing we did in the auditions where we would get to the emotional core of what's going on in the scene, you know, you want to leave the house to get ice cream or you want your dad to go away. You don't want him to color with you. Um, and, and then improvise around that. And all the actors were game with that. Uh, and I mean, Bruce is famous for improvising everything. Um, and Lexi you know, was always talking about how she was so surprised. She's in a scene with this guy and he's not saying anything that's in the script. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, okay, I guess I'm not waiting for my line. I'm just going to say something. And then. And, but that, it, it had such an electric quality to it when actors do that because they don't know what their scene partner is about to say. Um, so it really kind of. There are lightning in a bottle moments that we captured that um, weren't scripted. And then that became an, an enormous editing challenge for our amazing editor who um, had incredible amount of material to work with, none of which matched anything else. Um, and, and putting that together was, was, was the next part of the fun. Shall we move, are we? I, had, I, I was gonna give you an opportunity before <laughs> I continued to Babylon. I just wanted to ask because um, you guys have brought up time and time again, you know, studios are bosses and things like that. <laughs> now that you've gotten this movie made the way you wanna get it made, what if, let's say, a big studio came knocking on your door and asked you to do one of those huge, big-budget films? Would you even entertain the idea? We would never take money. Uh, never. <laughs> uh, no, we it's only really, ever want to starve. No, I mean, the main thing for us is being able to... We made this movie to show people what our voice is. So hopefully there's projects out there that then are still things we'd feel passionate about. And now, and it's already started to happen, people see us now as authors rather than just mm -hmm. as directors. So... They bring us in much earlier on potential projects to say, what would you do with this? What would be your take? And they're much more accepting of our opinion, even though it's the same opinion we would have had before, but because we've sort of proven that our, our opinion has a result that that has sort of some integrity to it that people seem to be liking. So the main thing for us is finding projects. If it, if it did come along, uh, something bigger, if, if we could still speak to our voice, something that we really wanted to do. And it was with people that seemed to want to do yeah. what we wanted to do. Like I have I had made a few horror films in the past where they didn't want to do what I wanted to do. And in the end, it didn't lead to a great movie. <laughs> and so being able to find those people that really want to make good stuff and collaborate with you. And it's just like anything else. Um, and hopefully with Freaks, you know, we have a little bit more credibility there. Did you notice the game kind of changed for you guys right after the TIFF premiere? It wasn't really... Um, immediate. <laughs> it was it was more pounding the pavement actually, hmm. like because getting the at, movie at the TIFF, hands of... you know, people like yourself saw it and we were very like blown away and grateful. Um, it, because when we were writing it, we were like, we just got to get this thing made. We never even pictured people seeing it. It's this really weird thing where you're like, it's a miracle if this ever actually gets finished. And most indie movies get if they get finished, never get seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when people started to see it, that like that blew us away. But then it was more pounding the pavement because the industry still wasn't aware. And like, you know, we we still weren't. It's not like people were calling us. Ah, I got the Barton Fink money for you. <laughs> um, uh, it was just like uh, we had to still go out there and be like, hey, watch our movie, you know, and listen to this pitch for this next thing we want to do. And Perry from Collider really likes it. You should yeah. watch it. Yeah. I hope it holds some weight. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's always a hustle, um, you know, but uh, it's, it's always fun too. Yeah. Well, before we run out of time with you, I kind of want to take the, the 
spoiler muffler off of Let's the conversation do it. Yeah. a little That's bit. That's what you were getting That's at before, what I and was I totally doing. forgot. That's okay. <laughs> Can I we ask one there. more non-spoiler question? Just because <laughs> sure. I like, I, so we wanted to talk about spoilers. We're going to put yeah. like a, a big warning so that if someone hasn't seen the movie. It's a great, movie to, the movie, it's a great yeah. movie to watch without knowing anything. But when you've, when you've seen it, it's a great movie to watch again because all these different things come together and you're like, oh my God, I didn't realize. Yes, I can confirm that now that I've seen it twice. But I just wanted to ask you just for fun because I love when a movie challenges you to like put yourself in a character shoes yeah. and figure out where you belong yeah. in that world because especially now with all the superhero movies we get you look at someone that has superpowers like they're the greatest luckiest person in the world <laughs> and then this situation comes with a lot of complications so did writing this story make you rethink whether or not you would want a power and if you <laughs> could have one what would it be and why um well since i was very young one of my favorite movies as a kid was the rocketeer um, and basically every day since I've always wanted to be able to fly uh, every time I'm walking down the sidewalk I think about how much better it would be to just take a few steps and leap into the air and fly through the air so I would always want to be able to fly um, I've thought about it every day and everything even we work if on if your eyes would bleed and someone would find you yeah even <laughs> even in that case even uh, if you're shot you. on sight <laughs> yeah. no. uh, stopping time seems pretty cool to me there's a lot I want to do in the world and it's just there's not enough time <laughs> um, but what you were saying before is, is, is something else that I really appreciate with you guys is that like so much now um, you know, people want to know everything about a movie before they go see it. But some of my favorite movie going experiences as like a movie lover have been when I'm sitting in the audience going, what the hell is going on here? What, what, what's coming next? I don't know. Because as, you know, a sci-fi and horror fan, like so much of what we see is so predictable. You know, in the first five, ten minutes, you kind of know what's going to happen at the end. You're just kind of, oh, all right, that was a cool scene. One of the big things we talked about when we were making the movie was Adam's experience seeing The Truman Show. Because uh, when he saw it as a teenager in the theater, he showed up five minutes late. And in the first five minutes of the movie, they explain oh, no. everything. Yeah. They say, okay, he's in a bubble, he's in Burbank, they're shooting a TV and show. And I missed all that. I walked in and, and, and it started in his bathroom with weird stuff you know all these people staring at him and he was so paranoid all these people but these people are looking at him and what's light, going on why is a light falling out of the sky I'm and like, I was just so like <laughs> in his shoes and so paranoid and it was like a, the craziest most surreal horror movie um, and I, that feeling that perspective of being in the character's shoes and also not being able to predict where this was going was something we really tried to do with this movie Okay, I'm not going to waste any more time. I totally forgot. This is it. This is your official Freaks spoiler warning. We are going to jump into a heavy spoiler conversation right now. So go leave, watch the movie, and after you have, then you can come back and listen to the rest of the show. Yeah. Haley, I leave it to you. Okay. I can't wait to see what this is, the spoiler Yeah, we, we barely, rarely right. get to talk about spoilers. Uh, now I feel a lot of pressure. Uh, well, I, I was actually really curious about when it comes to world building, when you're dealing with something like superpowers or paranormal in that realm, how do you make the rules of your world clear? And what did were there things you were like, I do not want this to be a part of our mythology? Yeah. I think a few of – we started from a very simple concept. It was kind of – one of the big inspirations was this podcast, uh, this American Life podcast actually mm -hmm. that we listened to. It's quite famous. And they talked about – Basically, if people had superpowers, um, what would they do? And they asked people, if you could fly, what would you do? And if you could turn invisible, what would you do? And most people said, if I could fly, I'd go to Paris. And if I could turn invisible, I'd I'd spy on my ex-wife. And like he asked all these people. And at the end of the podcast, he goes, you know what nobody said? Fight crime or like help people. And so we kind of realized that's totally true. If, if people had powers, they would just use them for themselves. And so one of our first rules was – they never help people. They never try and save the world. They never get into a group and have nicknames and wear fancy clothes. Basically, people only just have these powers and they use them for themselves. And then sort of our world building came from there. So basically, if people did that, government and people without powers would start to not like these people turning invisible and stealing stuff or whatever and would make it illegal. And if they made it illegal, those people would have to do it more and go underground. And if they went underground, people would trust them less and there'd basically be a cycle of violence. And so we just quickly just started thinking about what the real world would do. And then we, and then from there looked at all the different times through history where the government um, or people have persecuted or separated or shunned people from being different. And then just basically asked ourselves, how could we do that in this world? And so a lot of the details in the movie, like 
her being put into a family across the street to pretend like she's not um, not special mm-hmm. is um, you know related to like kids in World War II being Jewish kids being put into so other that's families. Kind of what I I grew up going to a Jewish school and they would always every day we would have basically Holocaust stories, <laughs> um, and so you know stories of parents trying to protect their kids. Um, that that kind of kinder transport thing that influenced that element, but we were also writing it during Trump's camp- campaign, um, and just the xenophobic rhetoric and stuff all found its way into the the stew of the world. But I think your question was, what didn't we want to include? Like, yeah, you what, were, what, what were some we wanna... hard rules you had? I mean, yeah. I, I feel that that answer particularly about them not fighting crime and stuff is really interesting. Yeah. But are there other things that you were like, this is not? Our version of powers. Or yeah, well, like that. Uh, absolutely. One of the other important things was not making anyone good <laughs> or evil. Yeah, like no one in life is all good or all evil, and so much of the superhero mythology is about that. And we just wanted all the characters to be human and messy, and you know, have big plans and then fail. Yeah. Um, which is stuff you don't really see. Like usually in the superhero genre, it's like they have a plan. Maybe they fail a little, but then they succeed. Mm-hmm. And and they're always trying to save the world. Yeah. We wanted to them just be saving themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, another rule that we put in place was when you watch Marvel movies and stuff, they basically seem un- to have unlimited amounts of use of their power, which we were like that – you know, if we had to jog across the street, we'd be tired. <laughs> Imagine if you had to like, you, we wanted the idea that these powers take a physical toll, like running a marathon. Um, and so <laughs> that we kind of came up with yeah, these four like, stages. Because if you had, you know, pew, pew, pew powers, like, <laughs> that would that would wear you out yeah. probably. So like, we, we had actually, there actually be, used to be a huge bigger part of the movie about, yes, a few times you see him drinking Gatorade. And that was sort of related to this idea that using powers is like running a marathon mm-hmm. and they have to like replenish their electrolytes and stuff. <laughs> and basically the four steps. And he gets so exhausted he passes yeah. out. Mm-hmm. The four steps were first you get tired. The th- second step was your eyes. Basically you start hemorrhaging. Your eyes start bleeding. The third step is you start bleeding out of the mouth. And then the last step is you pass out. And so a few times in the movie you see them continue through those steps. Um, and then the last kind of thing about the powers that was a rule for us was that each of the powers – are based on what their deepest desire is. Ooh. So basically each of the character's powers is related to their character and what they want. So Chloe is a kid who just wants control and wants to get outside. And so her two powers are mind control and the ability to kind of, t- we called it mental Skype, basically bring people <laughs> mentally into her space because she can't leave the space. Yeah. And then mom wants to escape so she can fly. Dad wants to protect his daughter. And so he puts her in a literal bubble. He wants to basically stop the world. From finding her, and Bruce Stern's just a trickster, <laughs> so he can just turn invisible and manipulate people and and that type of stuff. So, and you know, our thought there was just that that way it was sort of really grounded and and came from the characters rather than, um, you know, just oh that person can the, yeah the, the, shoot the, arrows really. Good. The other thing we <laughs> we started to like as writers started to go back into the tropes of like, okay, well, maybe they have some high-tech, like, sci-fi way of detecting these people's DNA and stuff like that. And then we're like, no, they don't have any of that. <laughs> this is our, this should be our world, you know? The only thing they've got are these UV flashlights where they're trying to see blood traces. Like, that's what we have. So we didn't want, like, sci-fi weaponry or, like, you know, special uh, antidotes to the powers. We or, often, when we were writing, too, would you'd start to want to do the easy thing, which is like, okay, they hack into this system and they find out this information. And then we'd go, no, 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 no. If we had to break into a jail, like how would we do it? And we'd be like, like we have no, no skill, like, we have no yeah. ability to do it. So what would we try? And we just like, so we kept asking ourselves through the whole writing process, like what would we do? What in would this normal journey? people really do, you know, if they had to do do this stuff? I have so many questions, but now all I can picture uh, myself doing right now is running a marathon yes. with my eyes bleeding. Um, did you ever imagine what life would be like for individuals with powers in other countries, especially mm-hmm. considering you wrote this during a uh, an interesting uh, political climate? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, one of the unfortunate things is that, like, it's not – persecution of the other isn't limited to America. It's, like, happened everywhere and always throughout history. So To the point where people asked us – the film came out at the Toronto Film Festival, which was a few years after Trump's election – and at the time, it was just happening that kids were being separated from their families and put in, in, you know, basically in camps. 
And everyone was like, which happens in our movie, <laughs> basically. And they were like, how did you know? Like, this is so relevant. And we're like, well, unfortunately, basically, when we started writing this movie, that was science fiction. But we went through history and just looked yeah. at what happens. And that's history what happens. History repeats itself. People just, when they find the other, they put them in camps and separate them, you know, and and that's what was happening again. And so it wasn't that we were we clairvoyant. We actually thought we, Trump, you know, when we were writing, we we thought Trump would lose and he would just be this, like, ridiculous footnote to history. We actually had conversations about should we go down this path? Because this pro- this won't be relevant in two oh, years when oh, the movie comes out. But she were right. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. we literally were worried. We're like, how far should we go with this? No one's going to care about, you know, xenophobia, uh, xenophobia and, and you stuff. Know. Like, And it only got worse, which oh, we didn't that's anticipate. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, let's take this in a slightly lighter direction before we wrap up. <laughs> sure. Because uh, nobody likes to say goodbye on a note of xenophobia. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also very curious about the extent to which since this is so much built around a sense of mystery Mm. how many of those questions you wanted to directly answer how many sort of things you wanted to leave open to interpretation like Mm -hmm. dallas stuff Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. all these references to her mother's history things like that. i love how deep you're getting (laughs) (laughs) well one of the crazy things is that's really hard to do when you're writing a mystery is to write a mystery because you know all the answers so you're trying to write something guessing at which point people will make the connection. Mm-hmm. And you can't over-explain it because then they're ahead or they, they feel like you're talking down to them. But you can't under-explain it because then they feel like, okay, get on with it. I want to know the answer. And the, so we did this really interesting The first draft of our thing. script, we, uh, yeah, we thought, oh, my gosh, we've planned out the perfect reveals and, like, it's so mysterious. And we did a stage reading of it. And nobody got it. They were like, <laughs> they got to the end. They're like, what happened? Are they ghosts? Is this all a dream? <laughs> You're ghosts? Oh, oh yeah, like it's all house? in dad's head, right? And we were just like, <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> I guess nobody got it. Um, and so that really set us on this path, kind of being inspired by Pixar and the other animation studios that do a lot of iteration. We're like, okay, we've got no money, but but we're willing to put in the sweat of like constantly rewriting it. So we would kind of... We did five or six staged readings while we were writing um, with newbie, you know, fresh uh, fresh ears. And we would get actor friends together and read the script for just a small group of like 10 people to see what they were getting when, you know, sometimes we would stop every 10 pages and be like, what do you think's going on? Like, what? who are these people? Are you What's, bored now? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, we did the same thing in the editing. Like, we edited for three or four months and showed the movie every single weekend to a group of five people. And they would say like one of the hardest ones was dad's power in the original draft of the script it was all done with sound no bubble and you just we just thought people would get it mm-hmm. like that like, they would oh, hear yeah, the birds frozen. the birds would stop chirping and stuff and everyone was like what is dad's power like i don't understand and when he froze her in the middle of the street and, and they were like what is going on what like no one understood it whatsoever and dallas was actually something that was added in the editing oh really um people would say like they would say uh why don't they why I get that they don't like freaks, but why do they really not like mm. freaks? I don't get it. Like, and we realized we needed some sort of 9/11 type, just a tinkle of it that you just if you saw that there was an attack, anything they did was justified. But without that, or they would think anything they sure. did was justified. So, yeah. so with Dallas, we we wanted to we wanted to um, come up with a medium sized, you know, big city, but where nothing has happened in our world, so that people would really be like, whoa. Uh, and there's sort of, in our minds, a, a debate to be had where the government says Freak Kid was in Dallas and Dallas got destroyed and that's why we need to kill all these kids. But it could have been that Freak Kids were there and they dropped a bomb on Dallas <laughs> and are blaming the Freak Kids, but they're, they're the ones who wiped the it funny out. Thing so is we... it's sort of, the you know, in this world, it's probably conspiracy theory. They're <laughs> Dallas truthers <laughs> trying to get to the bottom of what happened in Dallas. Uh-huh. The funny thing is we showed the movie in Dallas at the Dallas International Film Festival. And everyone was, we were kind of nervous. We were like, what's going to happen? Are they going to like hate it or like it? Their their reaction was something we did not anticipate, which was, that was so cool. You change it for every city? Like, that was (laughs) something like, (laughs) (laughs) Like, uh, you know? Um, But yeah, so throughout the whole movie, there was a lot of figuring out. And it's really interesting. One of the things we learned, which I didn't know before doing the movie, was there's almost a bell curve. Like, some people would get stuff way earlier compared to others. Some people would get it way later, mm-hmm. and the most people would kind of get get certain things. We'd stop the movie and say, at what point did you realize she had powers? Mm-hmm. And no one would say the same thing. 
it's not like there was like one thing where I see dead people and everyone gets it. Mm -hmm. Like it's this moving bell curve. And so it's interesting when you're trying to make something to kind of keep everyone interested, the ones that are way ahead of it and the ones that are kind of lagging behind. Yeah. And on second viewing, we, we hope it's really fun for people on second viewing because we had a lot of Easter egg type seeds that are planted in there where, for instance, the sound um, when the time bubble is up, we took uh, crickets and birds, sort of the typical a- ambient sounds, and slowed them down 10,000%. So it's got this weird feeling, almost like you're in a submarine and there's whale song going on out there. There's <laughs> Every time, time is frozen. But it's actually crickets. Oh, and, that's interesting. and then like when his power stops and time comes back to normal, it immediately goes back oh. to the normal ambience. So that's just one kind of example of like something you might get on second view. Yeah, I mean, to go even deeper, something that no one will notice unless we explain it to you, <laughs> is we, d- we did a lot of thinking about what it would be like to live inside of a time bubble. And one of the things we realized is water and electricity wouldn't function because water pressure and electron flow <laughs> wouldn't correctly go through the right. bubble. And so they drink out of bottled water and have batteries whenever they're in the bubble. And whenever he falls asleep, <laughs> the lights turn on and the tap starts dripping and stuff like that. So we went pretty deep into yeah. what it would be like. I was like. just going to say, you say I went deep with my questions, but it's, <laughs> it's rare that I get such deep answers. Well, that's turn. why we loved your questions. <laughs> you we know. never get to talk about it. I don't know how deep this is, but before we have to wrap up, I have one more story question for you. In this world that you created here, are human Superpower is something that turned on for a specific reason, or it, mm. is it something that evolves? Because it That's is really mentioned that they get more powerful with yeah. We kind of thought that basically, if if it gets powered by every more powerful with every generation, then you can kind of go backwards. Where you know, Grandpa's generation has powers that are visible, but his grandpa may have had very minor powers, and his grandpa may have had almost the slightest. You know, maybe he just had a great intuition or like <laughs> was really good at sleight of hand or something. But over time, as these different people with abilities met up and and as segregation and, and kind of persecution forced them together, it sort of it made a purer line of mm. this mutation or whatever it is that gives them abilities that gets more and more powerful with every generation. But maybe Mer- and, and, Merlin and, back in the day <laughs> was just sort but, of but it's a, also, a minor freak. You it, know? It's, it's also, uh, you know, a, an unintended result of the ghettoization. You know, as, the, as they get kind of forced together, they have kids together mm-hmm. who are then more powerful. Hmm. That's yeah. great. This, I, know, I wish we had a I'm longer podcast. So <laughs> why? This, all right. This Two-parter. Stands, come back next week. Really? <laughs> I mean, either come back and visit us again or yes, hurry up please. and make another movie, too, and we'll talk about that well, one well, as well. Thank you, guys. I mean, it, we're like... For us to make another movie, can, people have to show up and watch this one. Yes, yeah, please. So, so you guys were early supporters of the film, and we're forever grateful. And now it's just, you know, I, we just hope people come and see it. Friday the 13th. Yes. Yeah. Guys, Perfect. Friday the 13th, <laughs> September 13th. Please go see this movie. Also, for both of you, is there anywhere everyone can find you on social media, Instagram, mm-hmm. Twitter, whatever you got? Yeah, I'm on Instagram at Zach.Lepofsky. And I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Adam Stein. All right. Yes. And Haley, before we close it out, you take it away. Uh, Where can everybody find you? Yes. Did we have something I forgot? Oh, no. I mean, I really want to ask more questions. I know, like the pet question, hard. but we can't. Right. Well, you can find me on Twitter at Haley Fouch and on Instagram at Haystack McGroovy. And I'm at P. Nemiroff on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you guys so much for watching another reminder. Check out Freaks September 13th. Don't miss it. Guys, you have officially survived the witching hour.